first, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here to pay homage to Alex and to wish him a happy birthday. Um, I, I think we've seen maybe the first half of his career, perhaps, or third. Uh, it's been uh, it's also it's been a joy to work with Alex, uh, and in, in fact, what I'm going to talk about today is a large part a joint project with uh, with Alex and Martin Kasaboff and Bill Cantor. Uh, but also, it's been a pleasure to get to know Alex as a person and and consider him a friend, and we've spent a fair amount of time. I'm sure there's a lot of people here who know Alex much better and, and have known him much longer. But uh, I was very lucky, I spent two and a half months here in 2000, and also I spent a year at the Institute for Advanced Study when Alex and Peter were running a program on discrete math, I think it was called, and expanders, and I would say probably 60% of the participants were Israeli. And the common language was Hebrew, which I do not speak. But, um, uh, so I, you know, got to know him not not only mathematically but as a person, and to see him interact with Yardena and and what a devoted family man he is as well, and a, just really a good person. So it's really been a joy to 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 do that, and so that's why it's 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 really so nice to to be here and and be part of this. So. All right, and also the, I mean, the when I'll mention t just two tiny stories. One, Alex visited Los Angeles ten years ago, maybe a little longer. He gave talks at Caltech, UCLA, and SC, and basically I think I was at essentially everyone. I may have missed one. So Alex said, said "Ah, I have a groupie now." So <laughs> the other thing is, fact, when he gave one of the, he gave a colloquium at UCLA besides a series of talks, he was a distinguished lecturer there. And, the, and I don't know if Alex remembers this, but we went to dinner with Bob Steinberg, I think, afterwards. And Bob said that was the best colloquium lecture he had ever heard. So, and it was a very nice lecture, I have to say. So. All right. So what I want to talk about are, so G is a finite group. And I want to talk about uh, four invariants associated to this. So. Uh, Let's take a presentation. Uh, for G. And then there's well so there's four invariants. So let's let D of G, I think this has been used maybe by Avi Noam already use it, is the minimal minimal size of a generating set. For G. Uh, R of G will be the minimal size of the number of relations you need here. So by that I mean take among all such presentations, how many generators do you need for R as a normal subgroup? Not, a, not as a subgroup, as a normal subgroup. Uh, No. In fact, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Does the minimal number R of G occur when D is minimal? It does in the profinite setting, but we don't. It's amazing how little we know about this. Uh, and the length of G, L of G, is the minimal length of a presentation. And by that I mean, so you write down a presentation. Some, there's some number of generators. There's some number of relations that, uh, here. And I'll just take the, the length to be, uh, the length of a given relation to be its length as a word in the free group. There are other notions, especially if, if you're interested in algorithms of doing this. But I'll just take the, and then the, the length of the presentation is just the number of generators plus the sum of the lengths of the relations required. And then there's one other one, r hat of g will be the minimal size of the num number of relations required in a profinite presentation. Mm -hmm. 
meaning you just replace uh, the free group by a free profinite group, this by a closed subgroup, and then mapping onto our finite group G, and I just, the, how many relations you need to now degenerate it as a normal closed subgroup. So, and so one obvious issue, one, one thing that's obvious at the moment is that uh, R hat of G is less than or equal to R of G. That's sort of, that if you take a presentation for this, then just take its closure, it'll give you a profinite presentation. It's not known whether they're equal. Uh, and the only way to get a lower bound for a finite group that uh, for R, hat, R of G is to compute R hat of G. So you're not going to ever tell them apart by that method. So I don't know whether it's true or not. It's that, that fails for infinite groups. So, okay. All right. Uh, so we want to say something about the, these. What? It's not known if they're equal. For, for it finite groups, it's, it's, tr it's for infinite groups, it's false. I mean, R hat of G can be strictly less than R. Well, I'm, I'm, the D is defined over the minimal size, and the R, uh, R and the R hat, uh, well, R, so for R hat, it turns out the minimal always occurs with D of G minimal. If, if, D, if D is bigger, then you get more. So, because there's a nice way of computing R hat. We have nice invariant. But for discrete presentations, we don't know. Well, certainly for particular groups, you can write down presentations. So, <laughs> so, well, in, in those cases, it's yes. I mean, we don't know any examples where it's not. It's not so, if you can write down a presentation which, where where you get the minimal number, then of course it's, it's the same. I mean, and that, I, you know wh whether it's true or not, I, d I don't really have any great intuition. Doesn't, and and I don't think anybody knows really how to. Uh, decide this. So there, we need a new tool somehow to do that. All right, so let me talk about each of these invariants in turn. Um, well, I, I guess, the, so let's observe that D of G, you can at least say this. Okay, that's not very hard. Um, I guess the, the, the expectation is that R of G, so I, I don't think this is quite known yet. Uh, is less than or equal to, so all my logs are base 2, so I'm not going to say that again. I think it's uh, log g squared, I believe, is that we expect, you can't do any better than that, take uh, an elementary billion 2 group. That's also basically. And then I think also the, the expectation for the length is, I, if I, I, I think this is, what we would expect. No, I think it's, it's a conjecture that it's logarithmic, actually, R of G, right? Because <coughs> the log, it's, yeah, log. I think that without a square, no? Maybe, maybe. Uh, I, <coughs> no, <coughs> no, 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 yeah, for simple. Not, I think, take no, no potent groups, I think. I think you need quadratic number of relations. Yeah. Even a billion group. I mean, an elementary billion two group. You need all pairs to commute. No, but it's enough to, to say that. Oh no. Cyclic groups. It's okay. I'll, although I'll say something. It's, I'll say something about cyclic groups. It's actually okay. Uh, and Avinom, I, to my understanding, if I recall correctly, Avinom was the first to observe that if you could prove something about simple groups, slightly stronger, but that that would imply it. So. Uh, sort of reduce, re reduce this to looking at simple groups. OK. What's the best found known for general? Uh, I'm not sure. Is there, <laughs> Bill? I mean, the, the problem is, that we'll see. <laughs> we know this for 99.99% of the groups in some sense, but that still leaves infinitely many. <laughs> Quite a lot that we don't know it for. Though it's close, and and there are variations which I'll, I'll get to that where we know something. 
Okay. Um, all right. So, so I'm going to re restrict. I'm going to talk about simple groups. Okay. So, uh, let me just mention the, the following theorem. Okay. So I'll talk about this. So, so now I'm going to say G is simple. So uh, there's a theorem. You can always generate with two elements. Uh, this requires the classification of finite simple groups. Uh, Velocity's not here, so I don't. I, I don't think you can even do it asymptotically. <laughs> there's, in fact, I, I don't think there's any bound known. You can't generate a finite simple group with 10 million elements without the classification. There are, for some special classes, you can do it. For example, Thompson, any minimal normal, any minimal simple group because it's two generated because we classify them. So, um, and there's a few other cases where you can get bounds. But, and there's some other. So this was proved by, uh, I mean, J. A. Miller did it for the alternating groups, which is a three-line exercise. Um, for the Chevalier groups, people worked on this. For very, there's a nice paper of Albert and Thompson, and various people looked at it. And then, but that Steinberg in '62 gave a general uh, proved it in all cases, and his proof was he wrote down two elements and then proved that they generated in all cases. Uh, but I'll just mention another thing. And then, well, the nice thing I really like this thing for lots of reasons, but one, one in particular is that. Okay, you need to do it for the sporadic groups. And Oshbacher and I did the last 12 cases. And so we get quoted for it all the time. So, <laughs> All right. But there's also a, version, a var variation of this. Uh, I'll just say P2 of G goes to 1 as G goes to infinity. Meaning you just the probability that a random pair generates goes to 1 as the order of the simple group goes to infinity. Uh, this was proved by uh, Dixon for the alternating groups and for, by Cantor and Lobotsky for the classical groups and then by Liebeck and Shalev for the exceptional groups. Uh, in, a, in the last case, it was a pretty complicated proof, which in fact can now be replaced by uh, sort of using results about algebraic groups. You can prove stronger results with uh, sort of just by general nonsense. You prove something about the algebraic group. And, uh, and use Lang they to get. So not only can you, you randomly, if you fix the rank, which includes the exceptional groups, take any two non-commuting words in the free group, the probability that if you take a random pair of elements in the group that you, and you substitute them into your words, that they generate goes to one, as Q goes to infinity as well. That's the result with uh, Emmanuel and uh, Ben Green and, and Terry Tao, so. And then another, version of this so is that in fact not only can it be generated by two elements but you can pick the first one arbitrarily I mean so if you take then implies that there exists an X and G uh, this is a theorem that Bill and I proved a while ago maybe 2000 or something like that okay uh, uh, G. Uh, yeah, he did. He also had something like <laughs> similar. We we actually prove a probabilistic result, as well, about something of this. Although it's not true. It's certainly not true that the probability goes to one. In fact, the probability can be as small as you want that if you pick something, but it's positive. Think of a three cycle in AN. If you take a random element of AN, you're not going to generate. But you can find things uh, that do. So, okay. All right. This, so anyway, in our presentations, uh, we can't always take two. Sometimes, and in the profinite case, you always want to take two. But in the other case, sometimes it's actually better to work with more than two. Makes the the presentation simpler. All right. Well, okay. Uh, let me mention the, the cyclic group. So what, what if I take g equals z mod p z, p prime? Well, of course, it's generated by one element. That's fine. Uh, but if you think of, if you want to generate, say, with one element, what's the relation? x to the p is 1. Well, that's awfully long. That's the length of it. 
So it's only one relation, that's fine, but the length of it is the order of the group. And in fact, it's not very hard to see that if you take a presentation with a bounded number of generators, then you will, you'll never get to log or any power of log. You're going to need something like some, a power of p relations. And in fact, there's a paper of uh, Danny Goldstein and uh, Al Hales and Richard Stong where they work, that, work out exactly what the worst, you know, what, what, what you have to do. But anyway, so you, there, there is no, I'll s just say it this way, no bounded short presentation. So if you bound the number of generators, then the length, it can't be short. So, okay, so you might think, well, okay, well, that's the simplest simple group, so it must be true for the non-abelian simple groups as well. And I'll, I'll come back to that later. Okay. Um, of course, we know lots of nice presentations for simple groups, which are quite useful for the symmetric group. Which it's not simple, but <coughs> you have the Coxeter presentation. Uh, for the groups, the Chevalier groups, or groups of Lee type in general, you have Steinberg, Curtis, Titz presentations in terms of the commutator relations and so forth. Those are, but in both cases, they're awfully long. There's lots of, there's lots of relations, in particular, uh, you know, for, for SN, there's essentially N relations, N minus, one, N minus one generators, and so we've got tons of generators, and then uh, roughly quadratic and n relations. For, th for the Chevalier groups, it's roughly, if it's rank n over the field of size q, it's roughly uh, n to the fourth q squared relations. Okay. In fact, go going back to the alternate, this, the alternate group, there's an amazingly nice presentation for the alternate group. It's nicer than the symmetric group, actually, due to Carmichael. <laughs> which says uh, you take uh, n elements, x1 through xn, you, uh, you assume xi cubed is 1, and xi xj squared is 1 for i not j. So it's about as symmetric as, you, as possible. I mean, you can, it, you know, you can a act on this by a huge automorphism group and it preserving this thing. So this is isomorphic to an plus 2. So, and in fact, we use this in what, what we do. Okay. All right, so uh, in light of the fact that this fails for, you know, you can't find bounded short presentations, I think Alex thought the same was true for non-abelian groups. And uh, so he wanted to prove this, that, you know, that, that there, you could never do this. Um, and so uh, he, he was, in particular, he said, well, okay, let's think about the profinite case. And so I'm going to write down a formula a little bit, which says there's a way of, that r hat of g is closely related to h2s of simple modules. And so he walked into my office at the institute. I had a, a nice office next, right next door to him. Not quite as nice as his office it was right at the end, which is now Peter's office. <laughs> Peter still hadn't moved to the institute yet. He was just visiting. Um, and asked me, I want, oh, I want to produce a simple group and some modules, so the dimension of H2 is big. And I said, immediately said, no, there are no such examples. So of course, once I said that, I had to prove it. So <laughs> it took a few months. But, <laughs> but anyway, that, that was the start of sort of our project. All four of us. No, no th for any pair, any distinct pair. Now, that's why it's so symmetric. No, that, for the symmetric group, that's what you get. This is the alternating group. And these are elements of order three. No, no, no. They're, it's completely symmetric. And here's the, mo you, you just take xi to be uh, i n plus 1, n plus 2 for i. Right. So that, that's why it's nicer than the symmetric group because it's, you can inter, you can get any permutation of them; it's still preserved. Okay, so th that was the start of it. Uh, Bill was vi well, Bill was at the institute as well, uh, and Martin was coming down 
fairly frequently from to to work on this. Uh, so yeah, it was so it was a, a lot of fun. Even if I couldn't st understand Hebrew, I could we could still uh, do something. So you figure I should have learned Hebrew by the end. My the reason I don't know Hebrew is when I was nine years old, I was started at Hebrew school, and I was also playing baseball in Little League. And my mother said, no, no, it's too much trouble. One or the other, you pick. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess. <laughs> All right. OK, so we started working on this, and we proved a, a very nice result. So here's the theorem. Let G be a finite simple group of Lie type. Of rank R, or say rank N, over the field of Q elements. Then uh, G has a presentation with C generators, uh, C re uh, C C zero generators, C one relations, and at mo and with n length uh, at most big O log uh, Q plus n. So bounded number of generators, bounded number of relations, not, not just growing, not with lo log. So for simple groups, I think the expectation would be log instead of log squared. But in fact, it's bounded. Uh, and the, the length being this. Now, in terms of length, this is best possible because there's just, there are, uh, just because there are enough simple groups, mainly SL2 of P, there's that's enough for, of the. That's a finite presentation, right? No, no, no. No. Ex I, but I'm not quite through. Okay. No, no. Well, first of all, profinite, in some sense, length doesn't mean much because it could be infinite. But except, and that's why we don't know log g cubed in general. This is rather annoying, except for pos the case g is twisted g2. I left out a 2. Twisted G2. Thank you. Uh, it's rather annoying we don't know this. People have thought about it. Uh, but I, nobody has a great idea. I'll say a little bit more about this when I mention the proof. So that's why we don't know log G cubed. If we knew this for twisted G2, then we, we would, these would be theorems. And, and it, it would follow. I, I, well, we have the, Cur the Steinberg Curtis presentation for twisted G2. So it's, but it's, you know, so it's, you know, well, the n in that case is two, so, or one or two. I mean, that's, so that's not relevant. So it's O of Q to the fourth. Here, this is Q. So that's not, not so good. But yeah, I mean, so there is a bound, but it's pretty. Got a bound, maybe, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe Q log Q or something OK, so let me just give a, a little bit about the proof. I don't want to give too many details. But uh, the idea is to, so this, the idea is to first do, and actually, this, by the way, uh, as Tits told us we had to do this, I think, this includes the case of alternating groups. Namely, that's when the field of one element you get the alternating group. And, and it, 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 the, the theorem holds in that case as well. So Q equals 1, 
corresponds to the alternating groups. And the sporadic groups, there are bounds known. Uh, Sweicher, I think, has probably the best collection of results for presentations. But if I, I should also say, uh, well, except for this last part, it doesn't require the classification. We're just, well, uh, no, my, the theorem is groups of Lie type, so it's fine. I'm not, so I'm not, it, this does not depend on the classification. If you want to say for all simple groups, then of course you require the classification, but this doesn't. Okay. The idea is, first of all, to do it for the low rank groups. And actually, that requires a fair amount of effort. Even, even SL2 is a pain, but uh, S, SU3 and, uh, and the Suzuki groups and twisted G2, well, are problems. And there's two parts. There's one thing getting a, the, the, a presentation for the Burrell subgroup that's reasonably nice. And then, uh, and, and then sort of one more relation to sort of you know, get the two Burrells, the Burrell and its opposite, uh, interacting nicely. SL2, this is quite pretty easy to do. SU3, it was done by Hulke and Shiresh. They showed you needed seven more relations, I think, if I remember correctly. And for the Suzuki group, Suzuki wrote down the relation. It was just one more relation, which is a very easy relation. It comes from the group Suzuki of two, which is a group of order 20. So. You throw that one relation on together with the relations for the Borel, and, and you're okay. The problem is we don't know what to do for twisted G2. So, but fortunately, twisted G2 never shows its presence again. So it doesn't lead to more problems other than that. And then, plus getting a nice presentation for the alternating group, and then the, which then gives you presentations for the vial groups, for all the vial groups. <laughs> And then you put it together. So you, like for SLN, you take a present, nice presentation for SL4, for example. Take a presentation for the alternating group sitting inside SLN. They intersect, uh, you know, and you, you throw on those relations and put those together. And you show, you pick up all of the Kurtz Steinberg relations. So you have a presentation for your group. So, so that's the idea. I mean, this could have been done 100 years ago, easily. Well, or, I mean, I guess you needed Curtis, you needed the Chevrolet relation. So, I mean, so it, it, Chevrolet could have done this, or or, Kurt, or Steinberg, or you know. So, okay. And if you ignore the one of the really the complicated part of once you do this is to get the length down, and I and uh, I let the I, I tried to stay out of that. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I didn't care how complicated the relations are, you know, so. Although, I mean, if you really want to program this on a computer, you do want to get these things down. And for example, a Eamon O'Brien uh, certainly wanted to do that. And, and in fact, Eamon and uh, Marston, and was there a third person? Oh, and Liam Green uh, were also had some nice results about symmetric and alternating groups, got some nice presentations. Okay, I should say, so, well, so a couple of things about twisted G2. So there, you, you still wanna do something if you can. And so there are sort of two things that we have done. So uh, for profinite presentations, there's no exceptions. I mean, forgetting about the length for a moment. I mean, we don't care about the length. Actually, Uh, it, no exceptions. So we can do twisted G2 in the profinite setting. And, uh, and also, I would say there's a more recent result of Nice and Katrin Tent who replace a presentation f with the notion of R compressible. They, there's a notion of R compressible. Which basically, you can describe the group in first order language, sort of with at most R, some, 
you know, f function of uh, length at most r or something. And they prove, in all, for all finite groups, those bounds that I put down uh, before, those are correct. Uh, not, a, not with presentations, but they're all like, you know, so uh, O log G cubed compressible. Any finite group is. And their proof is reducing the simple group, just as Avi Noam did, basically the same idea. And then they say, well, if it's got a presentation, it's fine. If it has a presentation of that length, then you're, you're done. So they quote us. And then for twisted G2, they just say, well, you can describe twisted G2 in first order logic with that, that case. So, that, so it's basically for twisted G2, you can, you can do that. And, uh, and I, you know, the G, G2 is a nice thing. It's the automorphism group of the octonians. So it has a nice description. And then twisted G2 also has a reasonably nice description. I don't know if our compressible is equivalent to having a presentation. I mean, it, I don't know. But anyway. All right. So again, uh, let me just remind you of a couple of sort of obvious questions that we still don't really know very much about. Is r hat g equal to r of g? I don't know. It's it. Nobody, uh, we don't have a clue really how to approach that. And secondly, the other thing was mentioned, does the minimal presentation occur with the minimal number of generators? We still don't know that. But it is true for, in the profinite case. And so, um, let me, so let me mention that. Okay, so, so now let's turn our attention to profinite presentations. So it turns out that r hat, there's a very nice formula for r hat of g. It's equal to d of g plus the maximum uh, I'll probably get screw this up slightly, but so you compute the, and this is the maximum over M as a simple. G module. So you compute the dimension of H2 minus the dimension of H1 divided by the dimension. And the zeta m is, uh, which way is it? It's uh, 1 if m is not the trivial module and 0 otherwise, and 0 if it is. So what, what you observe from this, I mean, so first of all, one, one thing is that uh, to observe is that uh, uh, r hat and r of g are both bigger than or equal to d of g. This is just by looking at abelian groups, you can see this. Uh, but in fact, what you see from this formula is that in fact r of g is, as we said, is bigger than or equal to r hat of g, is bigger than or equal to the rank of the Schur multiplier. Uh, take M to be the trivial module. This, that's what's coming up here. And particularly if G is a perfect group, then H1 is trivial. So it's just dimension of G2. In that case, the M is 1, and you've got the zeta. So, so if there's a Schur multiplier, so for example, uh, this says that R hat of AN is certainly bigger than or equal to 3, because the Schur multiplier is cyclic, a non-trivial cyclic. So, all right. But the nice thing about this here is there is a formula. So it reduces to computations in cohomology, which we still actually don't know all that much about, rather surprisingly. We know something, but uh, so let me say a little bit about cohomology. So in fact, but this says if you knew, well, it sort of goes both ways. If you know that uh, r hat's big, it tells you that h2 has to be big. And actually, it goes the other way, let's say for a simple group, because I'll say, I'll say about this in a minute. We do have bounds on H1, so H1 can't be that big. So uh, on the other hand, if H2 is big, we also know that R hat's big. 
And in fact, that was the start of it. Alex walked into my office and said, I want examples where H2 is big. And, and why? So you could show that R hat's big, and so R is big. Uh, OK, so let me, OK, I'm, I've got about 10 minutes. So let me just mention for H1, we still rather surprisingly don't know that much, but we can say, so, so uh, G finite. M irreducible faithful. If you, do, if you throw out faithful, it's easy to make the dimension of H1 grow. Implies the dimension is less than or equal to 1 half, the dimension of M. You, that's, in some sense, it's best possible. There are two-dimensional modules with h-dimensional h1. There's a four-dimensional module in characteristic 3 with a two-dimensional h2. Those are the only examples where you actually hit a half. But uh, I had conjectured back in 84, and I guess the philosophy is you shouldn't conjecture something <laughs> unless you have a, a good idea. It's true. It was true. So I'll call it a question retroactively. Uh, is, is in fact there a bound? It, let's say then you have to throw an absolutely irreducible. Is there an absolute bound on the dimension of H1? And up till I would say four years, four or five years ago, the biggest H1 that was known was four dimensional. And even that was, you know, there were families of three dimensional ones. But uh, that conjecture is, or question I'll, call, I'll say now, is uh, still open, but almost certainly false. Uh, Frank Lubeck has produced examples of very large H1. Uh, I think maybe the biggest one is on the order of 10 million. So we jump from 4 to 10 million. And, and it's doing by computing coefficients of Koch deleuistic polynomials. Uh, I, I don't want to say too much more about that. So uh, just showing that we really know nothing. We know so very little. For very Specific modules, you can compute it. But for most modules, you don't know too much about it. what's going on. So um, there is a result by uh, Klein, Partial, and Scott, and then with myself and Tiap covering the complementary cases of them that says if G is a finite Chevrolet group of given rank, there is a bound that depends only on the rank, not on the size of the field, not on the type of the group, just, just on the rank. Uh, the bound is pretty big, I think, uh, but anyway. So the question is, how does that bound grow with the rank? And of course, we don't know that it, we still don't know that it's infinite. So that it, that it grows with. Uh, so, but anyway. But again, in this formula, that's telling you that this H one is not going to contribute that much. It's at most half the dimension of M, so it's not really going to make much difference. So the R hat is. Minus, minus G is roughly the, lar the largest H2 you have divided by the dimension. So that's a very good approximation. And uh, so what, what we prove is, uh, so the, to handle G2 and in all the other cases, uh, so, so again, this is uh, the four of us. Uh, if same hypothesis here, G, again, so G finite, uh, M irreducible faithful. Implies the dimension of H2 GM is less than 20 times the dimension. Something like that. The right answer is probably a half. But, the, if, but there are examples showing it can grow. But now, now with, we still don't know, not with simple groups. And maybe I'll, I'll say a word about that. So faithful, yeah. If it's not faithful, if you throw on a big kernel, you can get the cohomology as big as you want. So. Just think of a big P group acting trivially on a, you know, a, the Schirmel, you know, Schirmel type can be as huge, so. Uh, Okay. What? G is a finite group. Any any finite group. 
It reduces to say, proving something about simple groups, but it's true for any finite group. Of course, if the group's simple, the module is usually going to be faithful. But uh, for, for any finite group, any finite group, so. It sounds more impressive this way. It's really a theorem about simple groups. But when you state a theorem that holds for any finite group, it's uh, OK. I should say this this result. I should uh, there was a slightly weaker version that Oshbacher and I proved, and then I improved it slightly, and then this is due. This version is due to uh, Cornelia and myself, Cornelia Hoffman, who, was, as I say, was my second and a half student. So, all right. Okay, so. Uh, so this why, in particular, this holds for twisted G2, so it's not an exception if you go to profinite presentations. Uh, I, I should also say the fact that uh, Lubeck, these large H1s to uh, disprove a result of uh, conjecture, I guess he didn't make it a question, of Wall about how many maximal subgroups a finite group can have, that it's less than the order of the group. And that gives a counterexample to that. OK. Um, and I say Holt conjectured this, Derek Holt, and he had proved a weaker form of it with, instead of a 20, with a log of the order of G in there. So, and then conjectured it and then, uh, and, and, and knew the connection with representations as well, so. Uh, and in fact, Alex uh, proved a result about profinite presentations using Derek's work. So well, before, before we started working on it. OK. So the real answer should be less than 1 here, or as I said, at most a half, uh, except for, say, the trivial module. But, and so in fact, so the conjecture is that at least for G simple, say, or, or, or G quasi, let me just say G quasi simple. So meaning it's perfect and modulo of the center, it's simple. Uh, that R hat of G is equal to D of G plus the rank of the Schur multiplier. And so in particular, it's at most four, because the sure multiplier has usually rank at most one, but sometimes <coughs> rank two. Uh, and so you expect four. And in fact, I think John Wilson has now conjectured the same is true for G simple, it, it, without, without the hat, just R, that R of G for a simple group is at most four. Uh, there's very few cases where we, we know that. Uh, uh, for the alternating group, if n happens to be p plus 2, where p is a prime that's congruent to 11 mod 12, you can give a presentation with a real presentation with two generators and four relations. So we're close, because it should, it, since the sure multipliers rank 1, it should be 2 and 3. But, OK. And uh, I've got just a few minutes left, so let me just mention a newer result. So. We've been, with TIAP, I've been working on this uh, conjecture, whether we'll prove it in the next uh, n years is, is not so clear. But we, we've done some cases. So I'll just mention, uh, so the theorem, well, so here's one theorem. So if, if I take uh, the dimension of H2 with the alternating group M, where M is irreducible, say, I mean, that's, that's the a critical case, uh, as long as you leave out the trivial module, is, uh, th is less than or equal to uh, some function of n times the dimension of m, where f of n is less than 1. And moreover, f of n actually goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Uh, so here, m is irreducible, or uh, you don't really need irreducible, but non and non-trivial. And a corollary of that 
is that uh, r hat of a n is equal to r hat of s n is 3. Uh, and if you take r of the double cover of a n, r hat of the double cover of a n, it's 2. And here I mean the double cover of s n that's non-trivial restricted to a n. So got the double cover of a n there, which is the best you can do. Uh, we've got some partial results for SL as well. Uh, the other groups of Lie type are going to be more complicated. This is what? This is, a new, what uh, this is um, both, both there. It's myself and Klaus Lux and Tia. Yeah. And it's we've had the result for a while. And I'm sitting on the paper trying to, the, the proofs are written down, but have to polish it up a little bit. And it's my fault. So, but now you know it for every n. Yeah, for every n. Just for n large enough. No, no, no. I mean, yeah, it's always less than 1. I, mean, I guess n, let's say n bigger than or equal to 5, just so I'm not going to be saying something silly. But uh, yeah, no, for all n. So it's not just an asymptotic result, which would be easier to prove, but we, we need it in all cases, so, which is, um, so yeah. And, and for SL, we have fairly st strong results and essentially have the proof in that, in that case. But uh, part of the, the, in some sense, for the other Chevalier groups, the worst thing is to worry about H2 for modules in the natural characteristic. That's sort of the worst case. No, 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 sir. No, I mean we do. For as I said, for some n we know two and four, and I think for all n we know three and what, seven or eight. I don't remember. Seven. seven. Okay. So we and and it's it's based on using Carmichael's presentation and just fiddling around, because you have so much symmetry, you can sort of uh, throw on a, another group on top and get a presentation for it, basically a direct product, uh, and and then quotient out by, by something to get up for it. So, so you can do three and seven. I, I mean, the, actually finding re, discrete presentations is more of an art than a science. I mean, the, uh, there's not, no great theory, I would say, for, for doing this. So you just be clever and then figure out a way to prove that your presentation actually works. So uh, I think I'm at time and we have to make, take a picture, so let me stop here.